Amen. Praise the Lord. Good song to sing just before we get into the message today. And let that be our heart. Our prayer today is revive us again. Lord, please encourage my heart. Amen. All right. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And we will read the last verse in this chapter, verse 51. 2 Samuel 22 and verse 51. 2 Samuel 22, 51. Let's all stand as we read this verse of scripture. 2 Samuel 22, 51. He is the tower of salvation for his king and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forever more. It says there at the beginning of the verse, he is the tower of salvation. The title of the message today is that, the tower of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you what you offer to us. I pray that you'll help us to learn from your word. I pray that you'll encourage us in our faith. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone that is listening in, either in person or on the live stream, that needs to trust you as Savior, I pray that they will understand what salvation means. Bless and help. Thank you. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Look back to verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 1. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies, notice this, and out of the hand of Saul. So specifically, after he knew that he was delivered from Saul, and of course that would be after his death, and David then anointed as king, and, and David is thinking back about how God has delivered him. And that's why then David wrote this song. Now, if you are ambidextrous, any of you, if you're not ambidextrous, you can use a bookmark. But I hope that you can use both of your hands and turn over to Psalm 18. Hold your place here, 2 Samuel 22, and then look at Psalm chapter 18. Because 2 Samuel 22 is repeated in Psalm 18. 2 Samuel 22 is repeated in Psalm 18. Notice what it says in Psalm 18 before verse 1. Notice in the little headline, the introduction. It says to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord um, delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Notice how that first part in Psalms was not included as far as in the actual text, but it was put in there at the beginning to give a little headline of the Psalm. And so understand that as things were transcribed, as they were copied, things would be changed. And then not only I'm talking about, not talking about putting blame on the translators, anything like that, but sometimes things get changed just over time. Things get changed over time. You can even yourself, maybe you've written a poem and then you come back a few years later and then you change a little bit of it. Maybe you've written a letter or something like that and then you come back later and you look at it and you say, oh, I would do this different or do that different and you change a few little things. Well, I think that's what's happened here with this Psalm is that this is the way we read in 2 Samuel of the way that David had written it and then we're reading in Psalms of maybe then the way that it was sung at the temple as the way that it was being sung there at the tabernacle. Of course, Solomon would build the temple later, but at the tabernacle, as they would then sing it, and they would skip that first part of telling of the, of the introduction of why it was sung, and they just started with the song, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. So you can see how that would make sense of how that, that first part there, whenever they were singing it, they didn't go that first part, but yet they included it because they wanted everyone that would sing this song to know the reason behind why the song was written. Now look down to verse, go back to 2 Samuel 22. Like I say, going back and forth there. But let's go ahead and look at verse number two and verse three. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse two. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. 
the God of my rock. In him I will or will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Notice what he says there towards the end of the verse. He says, my high tower. The Lord is my rock and will I trust, my shield. Uh, he is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. So he refers to God being his tower there in verse number three. And then as we also read in verse 51, he also refers to God being his tower. Now come back to Psalm chapter 18. Look at Psalm chapter 18. And let's look at verse number two. Look at verse number two. And do you notice how verse one starts off, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And as we compare that with um, Psalm 20, or 2 Samuel 22, you notice that it didn't start off the exact same way. That's why I say I can see as this psalm was then introduced there and they were beginning to sing it among the tabernacle that the wording would get changed just a little bit. But yet this is the same psalm, just a little bit of differences um, compared to chapter 22. Notice now in Psalm 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, notice this now, and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So we see here in Psalm 18 and verse number um, two of where it's also referred to and mentions the Lord is my high tower. Now look at the last verse in Psalm 18. Look down at the last verse of Psalm chapter 18 and verse 50. Look at Psalm chapter 18 and verse number 50. Great deliverance giveth he to his king. So notice how that it was changed from the tower of salvation to great deliverance. Again, as the psalm would be, as they would be, as they'd sing it there in the in the actual temple, as they introduced it in the temple, the wording got changed on it there. Now, I will say this: some of the people that are Bible doubters and skeptics and that they will take it to say, "Oh, look, Psalm 50, uh, 2 Samuel twenty two fifty one was translated incorrectly, and that uh, it should have been translated the way that it was." Psalm eighty. No, God has everything trans translated and preserved exactly the way He wanted it. And so what is the difference then between chapter 22 and then chapter 18 here? And the way that I would explain it best is that by the time they were then singing it there in the um, tabernacle of how that they had changed the words just a little bit. By the way, in 2 Samuel twenty-two fifty-one, 51, when it says the tower of salvation, that is the only time in the Bible that little phrase is used. The tower of salvation. We see where God is the, the tower, as we saw here in Psalm 18 and verse number one, we saw that where it's referred to as God as the tower. But that little phrase, the tower of salvation, that's the only time where it is found in the Bible. You're there at Psalms. Look over at chapter 61. Let's see another place here where it refers to God being our tower. Um, Psalm chapter 61 and verse number three. For thou has been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Look at Psalm 144 and verse number two. Psalm 144 and verse number two. Psalm 144 and verse two. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower. Psalm 144 and verse two. My high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I will in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Then one more verse here. Look at Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. Another verse that refers to God being a high tower. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. The Bible says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Now there is one more verse that I want you to look at. Look at the book of Song of Solomon. You're there in Proverbs. The next verse is Ecclesiastes. The next book right after that is Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter four. So Song, you're in Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes, then Song of Solomon. The, it's also called Solomon's Songs, the Solomon's Song. Some call it the Song of Songs. Um, but Song of Solomon chapter four and verse number four. The Bible says here, and by the way, this of course is Solomon, and he's talking about his beloved, and he makes a reference 
to his father. And this is really interesting. In Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Thy neck, again, referring to his beloved, he said, Thy neck is like the Tower of David. Now, this is the only reference that we have in the Bible as well to the Tower of David. And so Solomon is referring it. Now there's some that will be skeptical and they will say, oh, there was no tower. I don't know that that's translated wrong. There was no tower because as we read throughout history and we read of this and that, we don't read of any tower of David. Let me just assure you and, and, and try to give you some confidence. Always trust the word of God. Okay. There have been many things where the so-called Bible experts have said, oh, that was wrong. Only later to have an archaeologist uncover something that says, oh, you know what? That is actually right. And so just because they maybe don't know about the Tower of David right now doesn't mean that they won't in a few years find something about this Tower of David, find something where there's an inscription about the Tower of David or whatever. They might find something about the Tower of David. Also, let me just say this, even if they never find anything, one day we get to heaven, God will say, oh yeah, by the way, remember that tower? <laughs> one day we'll know all about it when we get there to heaven. So always uh, uh, rest in this, have your faith in this, that the word of God is true. Never let a skeptic come and try to shake your faith. Stay strong with the word of God. But Solomon makes a reference here to his father's tower. Now that, that sounds like a pretty credible witness to me if the son is talking about it. The son would know about the tower that his father had built. And David, I wonder, as he built this tower, which came first? Of David's song that we read about in 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. Did that come first or did the tower come first? And I could just imagine even the song coming first. And then later David building this tower. And he built this tower in his mind picturing what God was for him. David built this tower. And notice what Solomon says about the tower of David. Look at it again in verse 4. Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 4. He said, thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory. In other words, David kept the weapons of war in the tower. David would keep the armor in there. And he specifically says, look, continue on in verse four. He says, whereon there hung a thousand bucklers. Now, what are bucklers? Well, he says that. He says, all shields of mighty men. What's a buckler? It's a shield. In this tower that David built, where they kept the armory, the weapons of war, they also hung a thousand shields. Now, you can just use your imagination of how big of a tower this would have to be to be able to put a thousand shields in there, to hang a thousand shields. Can you imagine as these Soldiers would come in, returning from battle or returning even from um, uh, practicing and, and getting ready for war. Then they would come into the tower and they would hang their shield. Can you imagine as shields would be hung all around this tower, around this round tower as all of these shields would be hung and then the next level more shields would be hung and then more shields and more shields to where that when you walk into this tower, can you imagine what it would look like? to see a thousand shields hanging in this tower, plus all of the other weapons of war. You can just imagine the stairs going up and around, and you can just imagine what this, how beautiful that this building must have been. Levels in it, probably, no doubt, but this humongous, massive tower that David had built. Come back now to 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 51, because I want us to focus on this phrase, the tower of salvation. I want us to be able to see that little phrase there. So 2 Samuel 22 and verse 51, the tower of salvation. We still today in our country, we appreciate towers. He said, what are you talking about? Well, you just get between here and Stinnett and try to make a phone call and you'll realize just how important towers are. And you just get kind of in between Fritch and Amarillo and try to make a phone call and you'll realize how much you appreciate a tower. Um, if one of the towers here in town was to go down, 
Um, the other day, what was that? I think it was Friday, something like that. Groover. I read this online there that Groover, they had lost their internet. They could not even make a 911 call from a landline. Uh, their, their cell towers were still working, I guess, though, and they could use their cell phone. But I had seen that uh, uh, posted there from the sheriff's office that uh, the landlines were down. We still appreciate we need towers today. And if you've ever been at a place where you had no cell phone reception, and you're holding your phone and trying to get a reception <laughs> and you can finally get a call through. Whew, you appreciate a tower. <laughs> That's how much our life depends upon these towers. Well, towers were very important in Bible times as well. Now, these towers in Bible times are different than these towers I'm talking about today were the cell phone towers. These were towers that were built there as far as on the city walls. Um, they would be on a corner. You could have towers on the corner, but you would also, you would have one really tall tower, one big, really big tower. When I was over in Uganda, Uganda is known for having clock towers. And you will come up to these, what they call in border, a circle. In Uganda, they call them a roundabout. And you come up to these roundabouts and you start to go around it in the middle of the roundabout will be a tower and it'll have a clock on it. And then as you come up to it, you can see what time it is. Of course, walking around, you can see what time it is, but they won't have these towers. Something also that you see in Uganda and you'll see in other countries around the world where there are a lot of, of Muslims there and you'll see on the mosque, the mosque will have a tower and the tower goes up uh, a lot of times twice as high as the actual mosque. And sometimes these towers can even go higher than twice as high as the actual mosque. But they have these towers that go up really high. And a man will cry, uh, climb up into there and begin the Muslim calls to prayer. Begin crying out there. He'll have a megaphone. And five times a day, the Muslims are supposed to stop and to pray. And all over Uganda, you'll hear this of where that they will just start the call to pray. And you'll hear this guy get up there and he'll just start, oh, carry on and, and do all that. I don't even want to say all the junk and the words that they say. You hear it all the time. Um, but anyway, they do that and they're up in a tower so that the sound carries and that people can hear and that they know it is time for their prayers. When Idi Amin was there in Uganda, was ruling over Uganda, he wanted to build the world's tallest tower. Wanted to build it there at this mosque. He wanted to build this as far as, as, far as Muslim um, uh, mosque are concerned in this tall tower and he built this tower and one little problem it turned into the leaning tower of Pisa <laughs> as he built this thing this thing started leaning and so they had to um, end it uh, had to stop that thing but that's one of the things that he tried to do was the tower and of course, that even reminds you there of how different places around the world, they will have these towers. And it's a, a reminder to us of how towers were such an important part of life years ago. And you'd have this tower and you would have guards that would be up in the tower and they would be watching. And a, a guard up there in the tower could yell out messages to people down below. He could yell out below to even other soldiers below of messages and then messages could be relayed all the way back to the king or to the captain. And the tower was very important as they are looking out and they could see any kind of threat or any kind of danger that would be coming to the city. And so David refers to God and he says that he is the tower of salvation. Now, for us to help understand this today, I want to try something, and so go along with me on this, of using your imagination. I want you to, in your mind, picture yourself as just a baby. Picture yourself that you are born into this city, this city with the tower of salvation. And you're born into this, and you're safe. And by the way, all of us, when we're born into this world, we are safe. And what do I mean by that? We are, um, we have not yet reached the age of accountability. That if a baby dies, that a baby immediately goes to heaven. The Bible tells us that the angels uh, uh, carry that baby there to heaven, that it is not the Father's will that any of these little ones should perish. And so anytime a baby dies, they go directly to heaven because they are 
innocent. And so we are in this city. If we were to have died, we would be there in heaven because we're innocent. We are hopefully at that early age, we're told of the tower of salvation. We, as we're growing up, we begin seeing that and we ask, why is that taller than all of the other buildings? We ask, why is there a man up in the top of the tower up there? And we begin asking about the tower and people tell us of the purpose of the tower. And then people also tell us, but I want to let you know, one day you're going to leave this city. And we all at that early age would say, there's no way that I'm ever going to leave this city. This is wonderful. This is great. I'm safe here. I'm not going to leave this city. But yet every one of us, at some time or another in our life, we leave the city. What do I mean by that? The Bible tells us all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us, we reach an age in our life where we say, I know more than God. We say, I don't want to obey God. I don't want to obey those that are telling me what to do. And as a result of our sin, we have to leave the city just like Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden of evil, out of the garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were driven out. And so here we are, we're in the city, and then because we sin, we're sent out from the city. And now we're wandering through the wilderness, and some people enjoy the wilderness. Some people get out of the city, and all of a sudden they say, wow, man, this is great. I didn't have near this much fun back when I was in church. I didn't have near this much fun. And now look at this. Man, look at all the parties. Look at the life. Look at everything that I'm able to do out here. And some people enjoy living outside of the city of refuge, away from the tower of salvation. Some people, they spend just a little time out of there and they say, I don't want to be out of here. And they come right back to the gate and they come right back to the tower and they're knocking at the door and they say, please, let me back in. I trust Jesus as my Savior. To which the gates are then open and you're welcome back in. And children at an early age trust Jesus as their Savior. And they get out of the city for just a little bit and they realize they're a sinner and they walk back in just as quick as they can. But some people, they go out there and they enjoy it. Some people were never taught about the tower of salvation and what it means. They were never taught about the city and how that when you're in the city, you're safe and, and how that the devil cannot get you. And so you've got people living out of the city that are either out there because they want to be out there or there's some that are looking for refuge, but they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And so here's what happens then is that the enemy that wants to attack them, the enemy that wants to destroy their life, the enemy that wants to take advantage of them, he begins building imitation places of refuge. And he builds these places and he says, you come into here and you'll be safe. And they go into there and they, they join a religion. They join a philosophy. They get into something and they think I'm safe as long as I am a part of this place, not realizing that the wolf is the one that said, come on in, come on in. Some people never wake up. They never realize that what they think is a safe place is actually the wolf's house. And some people die in the wolf's house and they never make it to heaven because they were told a lie and they were never told the truth. Some people, they hear and they know this isn't right. They look around and they say, this isn't safe. They look around and they say, this can't be the place of refuge. There's too many wolves walking around. There's too many things around here. I don't feel safe here one bit. And they begin looking and searching and they try to find the answer. And they find the tower of salvation and they run to it. But the Bible tells us there's very few that ever even find that narrow road that leads to life. Again, there's some people that as an early, as a child at an early age, they were told about the Tower of Salvation. But they don't care. They want to go out into the world. They want to enjoy the world. They want to have fun. They want to get all that the world has to offer. And they're enjoying living out there with the wolves. They're enjoying living out there with the other people that are searching for the truth. And they know the truth. But they're not telling them. They're not warning them. They know that they could die and go to hell. And yet 
They're not saying anything. They're enjoying it themselves. And they might even themselves in their own mind try to justify, well, I'm okay. I'm safe. I, my parents are going to heaven. I, I'm okay. I've got a grandma that prays for me. They might even say, I remember one time when I was little that I prayed a prayer. But yet there's never truly been a conversion. There's never truly been salvation. And they're living out in the world, living with the wolves, living out there away from the tower of salvation. And people are praying that they will come to the tower of salvation. And people are warning and the gospel is preached and the message goes out and it says, you're in the world. You're living amongst the wolves of the world and the devil is seeking whom he may devour. You're out there with the lion, the roaring lion, walking around seeking whom he may devour. Come to the tower. God is the tower of salvation. And anybody that comes to the tower and says, I put my faith in Jesus, the gates are open and you're welcomed in. But you have to repent. You have to turn from that life. You can't live in the city of refuge and live in the world. You can't be out there. You have to come and say, I'm tired of that. I'm turning from that. I'm turning from those false houses of, of worship where they said that it was a, a safe place, but yet it was just where the, the, the den of thieves, it's where the wolves were at there. Uh, I, I'm turning from that. I'm repenting of that. And I'm turning to the tower of salvation. Why a tower? Number one, a tower is for show. A tower is for show. A king would want to build a big, beautiful tower. And we've read, we can read there in Song of Solomon, there's other places about the tower of a tower of ivory. I mean, a king would want to build a big, beautiful tower to where that everybody would look at it, they would see it, and it would get their attention. As I talk about Idi Amin wanting to build that great big old tower, that way everybody as they come and they would see it, it would get their attention and they would know Idi Amin was a Muslim. As you see the clock tower, you want a nice beautiful tower. And even here in America, we love pictures of lighthouses. What is a lighthouse? It's a tower that's put on the edge of the water. The light can shine out and give people direction of where there's safety. And we will have pictures of lighthouses. Some of you, maybe even in your houses, you have pictures of lighthouses. You have a picture of a tower because a tower is for show. It's for everything one to be able to see it's not just for show but yet it is there so that everyone can see it listen the tower of salvation the world can see it the gospel has been preached for years and it's out there so that everyone can see it god has built this big beautiful tower and it's free to be able to enter into it you come to the gates and you say how much does it cost to enter in and to come to this tower of salvation and the answer is it's free amen you just have to leave what's out there. The price has already been paid when Jesus paid it all. And so a tower was built for show and David built this great big old tower to put all of the shields in there and you know it was for show. That way people as they came and they would walk into that tower and they would look up and they would see a thousand shields hanging in there. They would, wow, that is impressive. Now, I will say this. About salvation, the Bible says that it is simple. And Paul even worried that people would be deceived by the simplicity that is in Christ. The tower of salvation is not very showy. The tower of salvation is not very showy. Now I will say this. When you're inside the tower and you look at the tower of salvation and you trusted Jesus as your Savior... Oh, it's the most beautiful tower in the whole world. Amen. But when you're on the outside and you're looking at it, you might even think, really? That's what I need? You might even look over at another tower somewhere that the wolf has built and you say, that tower even looks better than that one over there. Kind of like Naaman looking at the Jordan River and he said, hey, the rivers I've got back home are better than this river. Some people look at religion and they say, well, that one looks better than this one, yeah, but you better know the truth. You better know that it comes from the word of God. But a tower was built for show. The gospel's not just for show. It's not just to try to get your attention. But yet, the tower is there for all to see. 
Wherever you would be, you could see the tower. You knew how close you were getting to the city. Number two, a tower is for signaling. It's for signaling. The watchman would be up there in the tower. And by the way, the Bible gives a warning to the watchman that if he sees danger coming and the watchman doesn't say anything, then the blood of all the people that he didn't warn would be on his hands. And the watchman would be up in the tower and maybe he would see a wildfire coming. And the watchman would give notice of We've got a fire that's approaching. If there were animals, wild animals that were coming up, a pack of wolves or some other kind of wild animal, the watchman watching could give out warning and say, be careful. We've got a bunch of wild animals that are coming. Get all the kids that are out here. Get them in. Uh, um, be careful of your livestock. And the, it was, the tower was used for signaling to let people know of danger. And of course, if there happened to be a foreign army coming, in the tower, the warning could be given of, I see enemy approaching. If someone was coming in peace and they're riding on a horse and they're waving a white flag, the watchman would be up there and he says, a rider coming, I see a rider coming. He comes with a white flag, he comes in peace and people could go out and could meet him. But the tower was used for signaling. And God is there in the tower of salvation and, and he, has give, he has put us there in the tower and we're to proclaim the message. We're to give the warning to people. We're up there in the tower. We're saved ourselves and we're giving warning to people. Be careful. I see that lion out there. I see that adversary like a roaring lion. He's closing in on you. You better run. You better get in. We're giving the signal. We're giving the warning. The gospel sends out the warning to everyone saying, repent, except you repent. We shall all likewise perish. And so the tower was for show, it was for signaling. Number three, the tower was for security. You could fight from the tower. The tower would be for security. Whenever you go over there to England and you, you get to go and you get to see the, 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 this fortress that they have there where they keep the crown jewels and they will have these towers and people being there. And there would be places of where they could fight from the tower, little windows that would be open and they could uh, um, fight from the, the, the tower there. And so fighting could be done in the tower and the tower was for security. And our greatest security we have is that tower. As we come to the tower, God then drives the devil away. God keeps us safe. Once we're in the city, once we've come to the tower for salvation, we'll never lose our salvation. The tower is for fighting. And this is why we've got to come to the Lord and let him be our defense. And let me give you this last one. The tower is for show. The tower is for signaling. The tower is for security. And the tower is for storage. We read this where David had the thousand shields that he put into there and he put the armory into there and so the tower would be used. People could store things, whatever they might need at a moment's notice. So now I'm running around the kingdom going, anybody seen the swords? <laughs> anybody seen the shields? We're looking for them. Where did they get put last? Were they put into this? No, they knew exactly where they would go and they would have drills as where, where they could come running in and could grab the shields and the helmets and, and, and all of the armor and the shields and the swords, all what they needed and they could then go out and they could do it quickly, come running in and get what they needed and, and, and be ready to go. They had it there so they knew exactly where it was at when they needed it. The Bible tells us that if we lack anything, whatever it is, we come to God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We're talking in Sunday school about peace. If we need peace, we come to the Lord and he's got peace for us. We come to the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, whatever it is we need, guess where we go to get it? We come to Amen. He has abundance. His mercies are new every day. You say, what if I'm in this city? Then I, I do wrong. And don't worry, God's mercy are new every day. His compassions, they fail not. Once you're saved, you're always saved because of the tower of salvation. Everything we need from God is available right there in the tower. Amen. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it, for you and I, we say we're saved. What does it mean? We were out in the world. We came to the tower 
And we knocked at the door and we said, I want to come in. And he said, what's the password? <laughs> and we said, I trust Jesus as my Savior. And he opens the door and he lets us in and we are there. The devil can't get us. And what does he want us then to do? He wants us to send word to those out there. He wants us to be a witness, to go to those out there in the world and to tell them, come to the city. Come to the city. You need to come. You need to come. You need to be here. You need to know the Lord as your Savior. If you're in the world today, understand just how dangerous it is. Understand just how dangerous that it is. The lion, the adversary, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. The wolves walking around in sheep clothing. Understand how dangerous it is out there in the world. Come to the tower of salvation and he'll let you in. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for the Tower of Salvation. Lord, I thank you that I was not out of the city for very long. I thank you so much for my parents that taught me of the Tower of Salvation as a kid. And Lord, when I left, I thank you that I came back right away. I thank you for those at church that were preaching and telling me of salvation. And Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, I know there's many people that are lost right here in Spearman. They don't want to be lost. They just never have heard. Please, Lord, help me to be a witness. Help each of us to be the witness we ought to be and to tell them of where they can find salvation. And Lord, if there is anyone today that needs to be saved, Lord, I pray that they will trust you as their Savior. Bless and help. Thank you. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all